Tonight on Capital Journal, with the election behind us, we'll go over the results and see what the winning candidates are promising voters. State Representative Nathaniel Ledbetter, the next Speaker of the House, joins us to discuss his plans for the next term. We'll hear election reactions from both parties. John Wall, chairman of the Alabama Republican Party, and Tabitha Eisner, vice chair of the Democratic Party. And Alvin Briggs of the Alabama High School Athletic Association is in studio talking about the Super 7 football championships that will air here on APT. It's all next on Capital Journal. From our State House studio in Montgomery, I'm Todd Stacy. Welcome to Capital Journal. The 2022 midterm elections are in the books. Most of Alabama's statewide elected offices were on the ballot, as was every legislative seat. Republicans had a big night at the polls, winning every statewide elected office, from governor and attorney general, all the way to state agriculture commissioner and public service commission. Making history Tuesday, was Republican Katie Britt, who became the first woman from Alabama elected to the United States Senate. In her victory speech, Britt promised to be a voice for Alabama values and interests in Washington. What I want you to hear from me tonight is that I want to be part of the solution. It's not lost on me um, that that's likely why Alabama is sending a mama to the U.S. Senate, you know, to actually get things done. <laughs> So I am a mama on a mission, and I'm going to the Senate with some novel concepts to make common sense, common again, to implement solutions, to achieve real positive results, and to make our great state and nation stronger for our children and our grandchildren. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Uh, it's not going to be easy, but I will remind you the words that got us into this race. God calls us to do hard things. Also celebrating victory was Governor Kay Ivey, who won over 67% of the vote in her re-election bid. She told supporters to expect new ideas and proposals to improve education and make government more efficient. And yes, I'm going to fight every day to continue making Alabama the best state in America to live, work, raise a family, and yes, play football. <laughs> and I look forward to working with everybody to ensure that four, our next four years are even brighter than the last four. We begin to set the highest expectations and standards for America so that we can become not just the premier destination for growth in our region, but the entire world. And under my leadership, Alabama's government will always reflect the values of Alabamians. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, opportunity, from the Gulf of Mexico to the Tennessee River. Attorney General Steve Marshall also celebrated re-election Tuesday. He committed to work on reducing violent crime over the next four years. And the question is whether or not Alabama is willing to fight to defend its values, to be able to defend its way of life. Because here's the other reality. Are we willing to push back against the most hostile presidential administration the conservative states have seen in decades? Are we as leaders, are we as leaders willing to look at woke corporations and reject their liberal demands that our citizens have rejected? And are we willing to push back against the anti-incarceration movement, which minimizes the role of law enforcement and attacks our criminal justice system, making our communities less safe? I can tell you I can answer that question for me, and that answer is yes. yes. Yeah. I stand ready and I relish the fight. That's why I chose to seek this second term. In the Alabama legislature, there were only a handful of competitive seats, 
as most districts now lean heavily to one party or the other. But there were two district flips. Democrats picked up a seat in Montgomery after Philip Ensler defeated Republican incumbent Charlotte Meadows. And Republicans picked up a seat after Rick Realm defeated Democratic incumbent Dexter Grimsley. That means the party breakdown of the Alabama legislature remains exactly the same for the next term. In the House, there will be 77 Republicans and 28 Democrats. In the Senate, there will be 27 Republicans and 8 Democrats. Both of those constitute supermajorities for the GOP. There will be 37 newly elected members of the legislature. That means 26% of the legislature will consist of freshman lawmakers. There will be five new women elected to the House. However, the overall number of women remains at 20 due to retirements or defeats. There will be four women serving in the Senate. That's one fewer than last term. The Republican caucuses in the House and Senate wasted no time picking their leadership for the next term. In the Senate, there will be no changes as President Pro Tem Greg Reed and Majority Leader Clay Schofield were each re-elected unanimously. The races were competitive in the House GOP caucus as the retirement of House Speaker Mac McCutcheon brought on open leadership positions. Representative Nathaniel Ledbetter of Rainsville was chosen by the caucus to be the next Speaker of the House. Representative St Scott Stadhagen of Hartzell was elected Majority Leader, and Representative Chris Pringle of Mobile won the race for Speaker Pro Tem. Alabama's congressional delegation will also remain split at six Republicans and one Democrat, as each of the incumbents running were reelected. However, there will be a new congressman joining the delegation. Dale Strong, a county commissioner from Huntsville, won his election to Congress from Alabama's 5th District. He succeeds Congressman Mo Brooks, who gave up the seat to run for Senate. Finally, Alabama voters overwhelmingly approved the constitutional amendments on the ballot. Chief among them, the, the recompilation of the Constitution itself and removing racist language, which passed with almost 75% of the vote, and Anaya's Law, which grants judges more authority to, not, to deny bail to those accused of violent crimes. It passed with over 80% of the vote. This week, Capitol Journal's Karen Goldsmith visited two Montgomery College campuses to get students' reactions and perceptions of the current political climate. She stopped by Faulkner University, a private Christian university, and Alabama State, a public, historically black university. Next week, we'll hear from the students at Faulkner, but first, it's the students from ASU. How do the students on the campus of the Alabama State University feel about the current political climate? We asked and they answered. Question one, as a college student, what issues concern you? The first thing that comes to mind is uh, student debt forgiveness, as well as, I guess, nationally, I think we should tr try to focus on regulating our interest rates and like the inflation rates and making sure like once I get out of college, I don't get out of college into a job market that's in a recession. Mental health. Um, I feel like mental health isn't given the um, attention that it needs to be. And um, my generation is really trying to speak out on it and trying to figure out ways so that we can stop like generational trauma. And uh, student loan debt. So it's, it's something that affects all of us um, as, as black people in the black community. So I definitely think it's something that needs to be addressed. Question two. What would you say to lawmakers about these issues? And I would just want to emphasize to them to try and not be performative in the legislation that in the legislation that they form, so that we could uh, moving forward we have more quality instead of just. Uh, kind of checking boxes on like a to-do list. The African American community, um, it is a big stigmatism when someone talks about mental health, whether it be ADHD or schizophrenia or disassociative identity, identity disorder, anything of that nature. Um, if they were actually to sit down and delve deeper into what it's really like with mental health issues and how it affects everyone differently. Listen, li listen to us. I, I think a lot of things are, a lot of times in politics, people make assumptions on, on what's right for the people. Listening to other people, it helps you to kind of understand, okay, this is how we need to cater this towards the people that are really being affected. What are your thoughts on the direction of our state and country? It's kind of stagnating in my opinion. I'm disappointed, of course, in the results of the senator elections in Georgia and even that Herschel Walker was that close to Raphael Warnock. And for the state of Alabama, 
Uh, I'm not surprised. We've we're, we've been a red state. We're probably always going to be a red state, but hopefully that changes starting with us. Alabama is doing better, I feel like, in terms of like getting everybody to come out for elections and things of that nature. I'm still a little disappointed in the way that elections turned out for some of the states, and it kind of scares me. I'm very uh, terrified for the upcoming years and like women's rights and voting rights and the topic of slavery is coming back up as a means of helping in um, prisons. I heard a lot about the red wave. Um, you know, for Republicans and stuff like that. I heard a lot about that leading up to the elections and Generation Z had a, had a big part in kind of uh, holding it off a little bit. I've heard that it's more of a ripple. So um, that, that was really exciting because I think it's very important for us to vote. We, we have a lot of people, especially being at an HBCU, you're reminded of all of those people that came before you to fight for your rights to vote. And I think it's really good that we showed out and um, we did what we needed to do. For Capital Journal, I'm Karen Goldsmith. A rescue mission in Selma, a place known for its contributions to the civil rights movement, one piece of history is now in need of help to survive. Capital Journal's Randy Scott reports. The sun shines down on Brown Chapel AME Church in Selma, and it reveals scaffolding and construction workers. The church is in the middle of renovations, and for tourists in town wanting to see it, they say it's okay because important work is being done. I think it's a good thing. I think to look after something like this is really important. It's a piece of history, so I think it's important to see it being looked after. And yeah, that makes us feel happy that yeah. it's being looked after. The project is to renovate this National Historic Landmark, but upon further investigation, the task grew from a $1.9 million project to a $6 million project due to water and termite damage. Some of the fundings come from federal grants. Um, the foundation is actually working and the Lathan Company is trying to work and raise private funding um, to, to reach our goal. So what we're seeing today are the wooden cupolas on each bell tower that had to be reconstructed because the termite damage was all the way up into the domed roof. Historic Brown Chapel AME Church here in Selma has seen many historic moments on its grounds and many historic people walk through its doors over the years. Now the latest chapter in its history is about to be written and this chapter involves TLC. So we take it down, take the tower down onto the ground and start you know, dissecting it then to, uh, to get some parts that I could use to take home to my facility back in Baldwin County to actually rebuild the tower and domes itself. We have to get these monuments sit in place then after they do that, got to finish the work was on the inside, got to get all that done with the tarmac's been eating. How long do you think it may take you? Ooh, it depends on the farm. <laughs> and the weather. And the weather, yes. The weather cooperates this day, giving construction workers the chance to replace one bell tower back where it belongs, getting this renovation project underway. For Capital Journal, I'm Randy Scott. Next, I'm joined by State Representative Nathaniel Ledbetter, Majority Leader for the House of Representatives and newly selected Speaker of the House, uh, at least the Republican nominee. So yeah, I was kind of wondering what to address you as. <laughs> uh, you know, do we call you Speaker-Elect, Speaker-Designate? In any case, congratulations uh, about Thank being you. selected by the Re Republican Caucus as the next Speaker of the House. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Very humbling. Well. Take me inside that meeting. This happened this week in Montgomery. The caucus came together after the election mm -hmm. to have these leadership elections, right. not just a speaker, majority leader, down the list of, right. of, of roles. What was your pitch to the caucus um, to ask them to elect you as the next speaker? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that was uh, we've worked with all the members coming in as majority leader. We had opportunity to visit with them in their districts and. You know, we really had created a lot of relationships through the last six years as being the majority leader. And, you know, our, our caucus elections had been, we know, we'd been very successful in them. And because of the times, as much as anything, we had a good team put together. And I think part of that was just the relationship building that we had done over the years. The other thing I think uh, everybody knows that we're, you know, we try to do what we tell them we're going to do and try to be fair. And I think that's important. Um, and, yeah, we, I think, the, the ideals that we had going forward helped us some. I think there is some opportunities out there. I think we've had a good run over the last few years, and I think that's helped because if you look at our track record as a house with everybody working together, we've been able to move the needle for the state. 
and uh, had made a lot of things happen. You know, if you look at what I know Governor Ivey talks about it with the, the Jobs Act that we passed, over 65,000 new jobs and over $40 billion invested into our state. So a lot of that, the culmination of all that, I think, uh, was was good. Well, this is an internal vote, right? It's right. only in the caucus. It's not like you're on the House floor or anything. So right. it's, it's, a, it's a private meeting. And so all of us on the outside, the, the rumor mongers, if you will, all we know are the rumors right. and what people say. But is it really a contentious vote? I mean, you're all Republicans. Right. And so you know, it, this was between you and uh, Mr. Klaus. Is it contentious at all? Or are you all friends running against each other? For the- no, it's not. It wasn't contentious. I, you know, I think the thing that happens, especially in, in, in the last few days, uh, you know, it gets to where you hear a lot of rumors, stuff that's just not true and unfounded. And, and I even read some of that in your column, by the way. Right, uh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, I think I – think, uh, that's probably blown out of proportion a little bit. You know, you got you may have one or two members that may be for me, and and they get antsy when they don't know what's going to happen. Then you had members that was for Chairman Klaus, and they may get antsy when they don't know what's going to happen. But at the end of the day, uh, I think uh, it was very cordial. I think Chairman Garrett conducted the meeting. I stepped down. I usually do the caucus meetings, but I stepped down because I thought that was a fair thing to do. Chairman Garrett is the whip. Uh, over, he's right under me under the caucus. So uh, he ran the meeting, done an outstanding job. You know, I think he went through dress rehearsal <laughs> the day before, and uh, he uh, he had a, a, a methodology set up forth for everything to go forward, and and it was very cordial. Everybody was good, and and uh, I look forward to everybody getting back together on the same page. I mean, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's still politics. So there's a lot of said, things said and done, even though it's internal race, there's still a lot of things said and done that uh, just to try to get favor from one candidate or the other. So I, I'm glad that's behind us. But as far as the meeting inside, it was just as cordial as one could be. And it was run as smoothly as I've ever seen one. So I know the official floor vote will come in the organizational in January. That's right. right? What about like committee setting committee chairmanships and, mm-hmm. and other you know it, legislative roles does all, all that happen in january or is it kind of between now and then you know the thing we'll try to do and we'll start the conversations now and because you got to kind of get prepared the thing is you kind of get th- you go from there and get thrown straight into what you're going to be doing so i think it's important that we at least lay the groundwork and see where we're going of course the, t- uh, the caucus took a vote yesterday. Whoever their nominees was, they're, they're going to support on the floor, and it was unanimous. So out of 77 members of the 105 body, even though it's a voice vote in the chamber, you know, uh, they've made uh, an agreement and voted on it and ratified the fact that they would support whoever their nominee was. Mm-hmm. So I think with that being said, we just got to move forward and start the process of putting, you know, we got a lot to do. I mean, if you think about it, Todd, you know, we, we've lost a ton of leadership. You know, with the speaker and the rules chair and the mar- majority leader and the vice chair. I mean, it's it's amazing. Uh, I don't think I've seen a time uh, since probably 2010 that we've had this kind of change in leadership. So, and a new clerk. And a new clerk. Yes. Yeah, so it's a, a quite quite a bit to do. I mean, so we got to start putting the staff together. We got to start putting the chairs together. We got to put the committees together. So you know, we'll we'll sit down and start having those conversations uh, pretty soon. Uh, I think everybody needs time to kind of breathe and get back to normal so well I'm sure that over the years and, and even recently you've probably spent time with the current speaker Mac McCutcheon um, about potentially assuming this role mm-hmm. uh, what how might you be different uh, in your approach than maybe that he has been over the last six or seven years yeah <clears throat> you know I, let me first say Mac McCutcheon did an outstanding job and he's one of the best men I've ever known and he is uh, a man of character and dignity, and I hope that I can follow in those footsteps. Uh, I think Mac, everybody will govern different, you know, and I think uh, my style is is a little different than his. You know, we, we probably will be, uh, I'm probably more straightforward than I should be sometime, I'll be honest. So I think that carries over into the leadership, and, and I think, uh, uh, we got a ton of good folks that's going to be stepping up in those roles, and I'm excited for them. I know they're excited. Uh, of course, they don't know who they are yet, <laughs> but and I don't either, to be honest. That's one thing we didn't do when we were running. We didn't really, we didn't go out and promise a bunch of 
chairmanships or, or anything mm-hmm. like that because I think it uh, it would hurt us going down the road. And it, now we got an opportunity with with all those being open that we can kind of set those positions for people that fit some of the personalities. Hmm. Let's talk about the next four years. Um, I remember down at the BCA conference when you made this comment, you were asked about, you know, what are the big issues facing the state? And you, you didn't mince words. You said education, improving education was mm-hmm. the biggest issue facing the state. Right. I mean, I kind of saw eyebrows raise across the room. Um, and I really think that comment got a lot of people talking about the issue of education. Right. The governor has really been emphasizing that on the campaign trail. She talked about it in her victory speech. But what kind of proposals do you think we might see regarding education uh, next session or into the next four years? Yeah, I think it's a process that we've got to go through. You know, we didn't become 49 and 50th overnight, so we're not going to fix it overnight. But I think we've got to stress the point that it's got to be fixed. I mean, we cannot compete for jobs in the 21st century without co- fixing our education system. And I think, you know, it's not it's not the educators' fault. I mean, I think uh, they do a good job. We've got to rebrand some of the things we're doing. Uh, and I think we, we started uh, in the last session. We had a House and, and Senate committee, and we would meet once a week. And uh, I, I co-chaired it with, with Senator Schofield. And we actually come up with eight bills that we passed out of last session. And it was to move the needle. And I think we're, we're beginning to see that. You know, the Numeracy Act, I think, is going to be beneficial. The Literacy Act is going to be beneficial, putting uh, AIDS in K-3. We start that this next year. I think that's going to be beneficial. I think it's a lot of small things, you know, uh, and there's there'll be some of everything. I mean, there needs to be some charter. There needs to be school choice. There needs to be uh, every, whatever it takes to fix it. I mean, we, we, we I think we've got to quit thinking about uh, – trying to come up with a solution that just broadly changes everything no silver bullet no silver bullet i mean you we got areas in our state the only way we're going to fix those educations is go inside the walls of the classrooms and fix it there you know there's nothing that we can pass as legislators to try to fix a broad approach so we got to come up with a solution that's going to go to those schools and fix them inside the walls but i think it's crucial and in my mind just like i said at bca i have i haven't changed i think that's our number one priority hmm. i don't know if you saw this memo from governor ivy it was to all executive agency heads asking them to take stock of their state vehicle fleet report back how they're being used and the reason i bring it up is it, it kind of signaled from her administration um maybe a lean into belt tightening mm-hmm. at the executive level, getting a rain, a, a rain on you know, st- state spending. Right. Um, I thought it was curious, and I wondered what you thought uh, from the legislative angle, considering that we might be heading into a recession, and budgets have been flush, That's right. record budgets, but do you see <clears throat> m- maybe more belt tightening happening down the road? Yeah, I, I think it's smart. I really do. I think we got to prepare for the future. We can't. We can't just do what's in front of us. You know. I think we got to have a broader vision than that. And the one thing that I've stressed with our chairman is, you know, we got to be cautious of what we do and how we budget. Uh, and even though it's flush, and you know, you and I talked about it earlier, I think sometimes for the budget chairs, it's easier when we don't have a flush budget because we got money that's got to go to certain agencies and they put it there. But now when you got a flush budget everybody wants you know a little bit more a little bit more so i think we've got to be very cautious of that and uh, i know we're going to try there's been some talk about giving a one-time tax break or tax rebate to the people of alabama which i'm for i support that i think we gotta we gotta be very cautious how we do it but our education trust funds up 16 percent this year six percent of that though is because of money that's been dumped in from the federal government so we won't we won't see that again we know that and I do think there is a downturn that's coming in the economy that may be pretty strong, you know, with inflation being what it is, interest rates going up. Uh, I think it's going to slow the economy way down. So I, I applaud Governor Ivey for those steps. I think it's something we've all got to be cognizant of and going forward. We've only got a little bit of time left, but I wanted to ask you about the issue of fentanyl. We have seen just a crazy explosion of fentanyl, um, a, you know, a addiction, abuse, and deaths uh, throughout the state. Does, is there a legislative solution to this? What what needs to be done? Yeah, I think so. I think we've got to address it right now. I mean, if, if the governor calls us in, I would ask her to put it in her call. 
because it's that important. You know, I, I talked with one of the representatives out of Birmingham, uh, Alan Treadway, as you know, used to be the assistant chief there in the city. And he's telling me there that the deaths with fentanyl is up over 400%. I mean, it's affecting rural areas like mine. And you and I talked about that earlier, areas that you know that it's affecting teenagers and kids in school because they're lacing this in other drugs, and it's become an epidemic. So I think it's something we've got to we got to do. I think we got to pass a law, and, and people know if you put fentanyl in the state of Alabama, you're going to wind up in jail for the rest of your life because at the end of the day, it's killing our children, our kids. Uh, so it, I think it's of the utmost importance. I think it's something we got to address immediately. Well, we will be looking forward to the organizational session and uh, in the legislative session, the regular session in March. Once again, congratulations Thank on you. your selection uh, by the Republican Caucus as the next Speaker of the House. Thanks, Todd. Appreciate it. We'll be right back. You're watching Alabama Public Television. Next, I'm joined by John Wall, Chairman of the Alabama Republican Party. Mr. Chairman, thanks for coming on Capital Journal. Oh, no, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, we're still kind of going through the results of the election. It was a, a big election, midterm. But in Alabama, it's really not a midterm. It's all of our elections are on the ballot, or most of the state offices are on the ballot, the whole legislature. Really strong results for your party here in Alabama. Nationally, maybe not so much. but. What is your takeaway from the Alabama election results as chairman? Yeah. Well, you know, it, it was a good night here in Alabama. We, we not only won every statewide elected uh, office by a good margin, some of those were record numbers. We also held a super majority of this House and the Senate, State House and Senate. Um, what I love is looking at some of the local races. So we were, you know, obviously on the ballot in county school board races, uh, county commission, uh, sheriff races, DA races across the state. And when you look at those numbers, we kind of got done digging through those, we picked up 43 seats across the state of Alabama. So, you know, it, it goes back to that nationally, some of the things we would like to have seen better, but here in Alabama, we did see a red wave. We picked up a lot of great um, offices, including seven sheriffs across the state of Alabama. Hmm. Well, like you said, statewide election results, all Republican, Republican majorities in the House and Senate. But you know, when you have one party rule, it comes with that responsibility to govern, right? And so, you, you know, you can't blame the other side so much. That's, that's very true, very true. <laughs> so what do you think Republican voters expect from their elected leaders, especially here in Montgomery, going into this term? Well, you know, and I, and I think it's the same thing that we want to see, that both sides want to see out of government. You know, when you think about the, the people, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, we all want the same thing. You know, we all want to be safe, we all want to be successful, and we want a good future for our children. Um, and that's across the board. So when I look at policy, that's what I look at, what policies best accomplish uh, those goals. Um, and that's for me why I'm so proud to be a Republican. Because when I think about that, I see the Republican Party issues, these conservative values, best representing that. You know, we see, we see what's coming out of Washington, D.C., whether it's the education um, agenda or whether it's the fiscal policies. And those bad policies have real world consequences. You know, we see that at the, at the grocery store with inflation. We see it at the gas pump with, with gas prices. Um, and I think we see it in our education with our numbers here in Alabama having plummeted. So that, those are the issues that I'm looking at as we move forward as a party and as a state. Can we kind of, kind of put forth these policies that will help the people of Alabama be successful? Hmm. Well, looking nationally, zooming out a bit, uh, there were some really high expectations nationally, that, you know, for Republicans. We're talking about this red wave is leading up to the election. I mean, and it was reflected in polling. The polling really started trending more Republican, but that red wave didn't really materialize, um, or at least not to the extent that maybe most, some predicted. Republic, Republicans will probably hold the House majority, but not by you know the 20 or 30 votes, but only only by 10 or fewer votes. Senate still in doubt. We may not know until Georgia. Um, so what, what, what do you make of that? What happened to that red wave? Well, you know, I mean, that's, that's an excellent question. And I think that's something that Republicans across the country are going to be looking into and digging into those election results uh, state by state, uh, district by district, to see what was the difference between the areas we did do well and what were the difference with the areas where we didn't do as well. I know one thing I, I found very much interesting were the results here in Alabama, but also in Florida. You know, what Ron DeSantis did for governor, where he increased his numbers, um, 
significantly. I, I, I don't remember the final numbers, but I think he was getting, you know, around that 60% mark in what is traditionally very much a swing state. Yeah, that that's, it used to be the swing state. That's right, yeah, where you're winning by 1% or 2%, and then he wins it by 20 points. Um, and, and I watched his acceptance speech, and I found some, some, some of the things he said that were very, very, you know, telling to me and very inspiring for Republicans. You know, things like, don't be afraid to be a conservative. Don't be afraid to stand for, for these values. Um, and I think that's something that, that we do, that I think we, we as a party need to take across the country. You know, um, be bold, be, be strong. Don't be afraid to oppose the Biden administration. Don't be afraid to, uh, afraid to oppose these woke policies. Um, you know, there's always a temptation, you know, go middle of the road, try to please everyone. But I think Ron DeSantis has showed what actually does please the majority because he didn't just win with Republicans in Florida. He won with independents. He won with, with um, you know, leaning, uh, you know, more conservative Democrats. And so I think that's the message moving forward for the party is let's look at these values. Let's look at what we represent. What do we stand for? And then be bold about it. Um, take it out there. Don't be afraid to oppose the Biden administration. Don't be afraid to stand for um, issues like school choice or um, opposing some of the, the woke um policies coming out of the Department of Education. So no, I, I think I think there are things that the party could do better to communicate that message of what we could what we can do to engage the people across the country. Mm -hmm. Well speaking of DeSantis, we ran this we, we reported this interesting poll from Signal about the twenty twenty four presidential primary here in Alabama. Trump had a strong lead, but not a majority. Uh, and then you had uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis a strong second. But when you took Trump out of the equation, DeSantis dominated the field. So just, I mean, I know 2024 is a, a, a long way away, but do you sense even after this election that voters here in Alabama, Republican voters, are getting ready to move beyond Trump and, and seeing a DeSantis as, a, as the heir apparent? Well, you know, I, I think both of those gentlemen within the party are extremely popular. Um, you know, if you, if you would have taken that reverse and taken DeSantis out of the poll, Trump probably would have had that that same seventy percent mark. That's true. We did, yeah, that's, we, we didn't ask um, that question. But I think it really highlights those are both guys who are seen as fighters. You know, they're both guys who are seen as being out, willing to get out there and fight for their values, fight for what they believe in. And I think that's what the electorate is looking for. So it, it doesn't really surprise me that we're seeing those two as the front runners. Um, you know, we're obviously all watching uh, President Trump. Yeah, uh, I was going to ask. Do you think? <laughs> do you think he's going to? You know gonna that do it? that is the question, uh, really, that everybody is asking over the next. Uh, you know, I, I believe he's having an announcement on the fifteenth or, or somewhere around there, including Ron DeSantis. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, the the entire the entire Republican establishment and, and the entire you know Democrat. We're we're all asking that question. Does he pull the trigger? Does he get into this race? Um, I know he would like to. I know there are people who are encouraging him to, and I know there's are people who are encouraging him not to. So it's going to be interesting to see where that goes. But whether he runs or not, I think the, the Republican Party is going to have a great cast of candidates. You know, you've got him, you've got Ron DeSantis, and even down from there, you've got some really good up-and-comers on the Republican side that I'm really excited about. And you don't see those same figures on the Democrat side of the ticket. Um, there's, there's not the excitement there, you know. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to see um, where, that, where the national politics and the presidential side go, with another giant question being, does Joe Biden run for re-election? Or do we see, or do we see him have a challenger if he does? Well, yeah, that, that's intriguing. Just just thinking of a potential, you know, twenty twenty four matchup is the same matchup that was in twenty twenty, uh, right? You know, that's that's I don't know, kind of unbelievable. Well, and I, and I think you will. I think if Donald Trump does choose to run, it will be he will very much be the front runner to get the nomination. I think he would be very hard to beat. Um, as far as, as winning the Republican nomination. Do you think this election changes any of that? Because there's been a lot of talk nationally about you know Trump kind of being a drag on the ticket. Do you think Republicans might st take this election and say, oh, I don't know, may maybe it's time to move on? I, I know those discussions are happening. Um, I, I, heard, I heard some folks talking about that this morning, actually, on talk radio. You know, they were saying, well, how, how does this... You know, how does this election cycle affect that impact? Um, because some of his candidates that he uh, you know, had endorsed and, and did not do as well... That's also one of the things some of his candidates he, did, he endorsed did do well. But I think the most important question is how did his candidates do in the primaries? And they did very well in the primaries. And in the end, that is what decides the Republican nominee are the primaries. That's where the, that's where the power yeah. resides. Yeah. We're almost out of time, but while you were here, I wanted to ask, I had to ask you about this voter ID situation. You were in the news for um, 
basically when voting you presented a different voter id than a traditional driver's license yes yes w once or twice i i had my um i was working in the state auditor's office as a press secretary uh, for the state auditor on a on a volunteer basis um and had a had that id and at a, a couple times uh, had showed that because i didn't have a driver's license with me showed that asked if it was okay they had said yes and i voted with it um since then i believe the secretary of state has said he doesn't think you know that, that does not meet the standards um, obviously i will not be doing that again um but no uh, you know it's one of those things that that was ha something i had from working in the working with the state auditor's office okay so, but like when, when you vote tuesday Driver's license, like oh, yeah, always. correct. Okay, well, I'm glad you cleared that up, um, Mr. Chairman. Thanks again for coming on Capital Journal. Appreciate no, your time. It is always a pleasure to be here. Appreciate it. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. Next, I'm joined by Tabitha Eisner, Vice Chair of the Alabama Democratic Party. Madam Vice Chairman, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Todd. I do want to emphasize we we did uh, reach out to Chairman Kelly to ask him. We didn't hear back, but I, I really appreciate you coming on and your you, your time today. Thank you. Lots to talk about from this election. Let's start with the Alabama results here statewide. A disappointing night for your party, for the most part. Republicans swept statewide. What do you take away from Tuesday, and where does the party go from here? The, the big news, I think, from Tuesday is the turnout. Uh, and turnout was very low in Alabama, both for Democrats and for Republicans, uh, but particularly for Alabama Democrats. Turnout was very low. And I think the reason is that folks didn't feel like they had, uh, um, they had races that mattered, where, where, their, where their vote would make a difference. And if it doesn't feel like it makes a difference, it's hard to get yourself out of bed or take time off work. Um, to go vote in an election that's already predecided. Hmm. Well, there's been there's been talk over the years of you know bringing early vote to Alabama like they have in other states. I mean, I guess technically they have you have the absentee, you have the opportunity uh, via absentee. Do you think that would help with turnout? Yeah, I do think that would help. I know of several people who uh, called the party's hotline on election day because they had issues where something came up unexpectedly, they had to leave the state or they were in the hospital um, and were unable to vote. And that's not something that early voting, um, that absentee voting addresses. Uh, you don't know ahead of time that those things are gonna happen, so you can't um, ask ahead of time for uh, that early vote. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, looking back, it hasn't been that long since Democrats were competitive and successful uh, statewide. I mean, they held the majority in the legislature until 2010, mm -hmm. not that long ago. You had candidates like Doug Jones, successful candidate for Senate, Walt Maddox, who was competitive for governor. Um, how do you get back as a party to that level of competitiveness? Well, I think part of it has to do with the culture in Alabama, which is so accustomed to being a one-party state. So for a long time, it was the Democratic Party that was the one and only party with any power. And a, a Republican would be foolish to run against a Democrat at that time. Sure. Um, and, and now we have, we have flipped. Uh, and I think, I think it's a vicious cycle that we put ourselves in where uh, a candidate is perceived as not being viable, um, because they don't have uh, money and uh, resources and uh, a war chest to work with. Um, but they have trouble raising money um, and building support because people don't see them as viable. Um, the examples you gave, uh, Doug Jones, Senator Doug Jones, um, was elected in a very unusual circumstance sure. in 2017. Uh, it was a special election at a time when there had been other high profile special elections uh, and he was running against uh, a heck of an opponent in Roy Moore. Right. Um, so, you know, that really, it, it gave a lot of people hope um, that something was changing in Alabama. Uh, but what we, what we saw when 2018 came was there was a slate of great candidates who were excited um, about um, building on that Doug Jones momentum, and they raised uh, a lot of money. We had three congressional candidates who all raised a half a million or more. Um, we had uh, candidates who were traveling around the state. There was a palpable energy in the air. Um, but the reality was the results were terrible in 2018. The feeling was better. Um, that we felt like we had something to be excited about, but the results were just as bad. 
Um, and, uh, and that's really about straight ticket voting. Uh, we, we tend to uh, have a culture here of not paying a lot of attention to politics because we assume they are out of our control. So, you know, Walt Maddox, I think, is a great example. People talk a lot about how great that campaign was. And certainly, uh, Maddox did a great job. He ran a great race. And he was somebody who already had name recognition, was able to raise big money on that. Um, but the results were just as bad for him as they were for other candidates. Um, just because we, you know, we felt good about it, um, but it didn't change the facts, uh, change the outcome. And it, that's because of straight ticket voting. So vibes don't win elections. Vibes do not win elections. Well, let's look nationally, um, zooming out a bit. There was a lot of talk leading up to this election about a red wave and the Republicans were just gonna dominate. It wasn't just a vibe, it was reflected in some of this polling, um, but that didn't really materialize. You're gonna, you, the, the Republicans are going to probably control the House, but not by, but probably a slim margin. The Senate, we won't know probably maybe until the, the Georgia runoff. So looking nationally, outside of Alabama, what do you take away as a Democrat from that election? Uh, well, there were a lot of really important issues at stake um, nationally. And uh, there were important issues at stake in Alabama as well. Uh, but the difference is that uh, nationally, um, there, there were races that were gonna be tight. Um, there were states that were swing states. Uh, there were districts that had a reason, you know, that, that demographically were gonna be close. Um, in Alabama, we don't have competitive races. Uh, there are um, only five seats uh, in the Alabama State House um, that anyone could describe as competitive. Um, there are only two seats in the Alabama State Senate that anyone could describe as competitive. And of course, statewide, we're right now a red state um, where none of the candidates are gonna be uh, probably able to overcome um, that straight ticket voting. So I think the difference is that at the national level, those races mattered. People knew that their vote mattered. And of course they show up in droves when they believe that they're uh, gonna be heard, that their voice is going to matter. Mm -hmm. Well, one of those issues was abortion. And I, this is interesting to me because, go back to the Dobbs decision uh, over the summer, and I mean, it was monumental. And everybody thought, wow, this is gonna be a, a huge factor in the election. But then the months after that, it kind of waned as an issue and, and, and polling sort of showed that. But I think if you look at the results from Tuesday, it absolutely played a, a very big factor, especially in these swing districts and swing states. Uh, women in particular, I think, find it exhausting to talk about abortion. It's no less important than it was that the day the day that Dobbs came down. But it hurts our souls day after day to think about the rights that we've lost. Um, and uh, not only is it emotionally taxing to constantly be thinking about that, um, thinking about and talking about that, um, but it's also, um, it's, a, it's an issue that, um, as it's become more and more, as these laws have passed, so in Alabama, right, if you um, help someone to get an abortion, you might be criminally liable. That has made it very difficult for women to talk even to one another about their fears. I can't say to a friend, I'm terrified, what would I do? What would I do if I, if I needed to get an abortion? Um, and if a woman came to me and said, I, I need to get an abortion, what are the resources available to me? If I help her, I put myself at risk for prison time, significant prison time. So women not only feel like a right has been taken away, but they've been silenced even from talking to one another about something which is so core to our being, our ability to reproduce and to control our reproduction. Um, so I think uh, the fact that you don't hear women talking about abortion as much as you, as you used to is not because it's not still incredibly important and raw for all of us, um, but because there are now scary consequences for talking about it. Mm, that's interesting. Um, yeah, maybe that's why it didn't reflect in the polling. Um, while you're here, I have to ask you about just kind of the internal party problems that have existed in the for the Alabama Democratic Party over the years. You had um, a chairmanship change 
when Chris England came in, that was kind of a, a shift in generations, if you will, from the old Joe Reed generation to, to the youngers. Now that sh has shifted back uh, a bit in, from the different factions. How does the party move forward in, with these two factions competing, and, and, and where do you go from here? I think what you said is really important. It is, it is about race. It's also about generations, um, about kind of an old guard and a new guard. And uh, I think it's difficult when some people see it as a generational divide and some see it as a racial divide. Um, so we have trouble sometimes even describing the problem in the same way. Um, but certainly, uh, I think the solution is obvious that we need to work together. Uh, but that's so much easier said than done, of course. Um, I don't know anyone in the Alabama Democratic Party who doesn't want to see the party unite. I don't know anyone who's in the older crew who doesn't want young people at the table. I don't know anyone in the white party who doesn't want black people at the table, and, and vice versa. We all want to be together. What stands in our way are um, old tapes that play in our heads, historical realities about how we've treated one another, um, and a general fear that people have of being disenfranchised. And when everyone's coming to the table afraid of losing their seat at the table, people have their hands clutched onto their seat rather than having their hands extended to talk to one another. Um, so what we're seeing is a lot of defensive maneuvering um, instead of proactive effort to move the party forward. Mm. Well, thank you for that explanation. We're out of time, but again, I really appreciate your coming on Capital Journal. My pleasure. Thank you. We'll be right back. This year, Alabama Public Television will be broadcasting the Super 7 High School Football Championship Games. Joining me now to talk about it is Alvin Griggs, Executive Director of the Alabama High School Athletic Association. Coach, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure. I'm, I'm glad you invited me down. Well, I have to say, we're really excited about APT broadcasting the championship games. Seems like a perfect fit. Uh, how, how did this arrangement come about? Well, you know, it's awesome. Uh, you know, Jack came to see me. Jack Williams came to see me in early August, and uh, he had... Uh, went to Georgia Public Television and saw that they were uh, publicizing and ha carrying the Georgia State Championships. And for us, it's a great fit because we were not able to cover the state and now we can cover the state, the entire state of Alabama uh, from north, uh, west Alabama to southwest, to northeast to southeast. That we have our entire state covered that no one could, would be without seeing their favorite team playing in Super 7 State Championships in Auburn this year. Yeah, so I was gonna, I was gonna say, do you think more people overall are gonna be able to watch these games, maybe than than in years past? Oh yes, you know, in the years past, we've only been able to get pockets, and it depends on what carry you had. Yeah. But with public television, everybody has an album, and so it's amazing uh, that we were. I'm glad we were able to work it out and and get everything worked out and. I'm excited about it. I'm really excited about it because it gives our fans in the state of Alabama an opportunity to, to see their favorite teams participate. Well, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about because in years past, I've wanted to, to watch, but, oh, I didn't have this the right cable package mm -hmm. or, or what have you. But, yeah, I mean, um, I came up in Prattville, so they, they used to be in the championship yes. games all mm -hmm. the time, so we'd really want to, to tune in. So, so having it on public television seems to really make sense. Um, I know that the uh, you mentioned it being in Auburn this year, so the Super Seven rotates for through different college stadiums, right? Where yes. are we on that rotation? We're in Jordan Hare this year. We on, we on a, this is the first year of a three year three rotation college. Uh, just a little background on that: uh, Ron Anders uh, from from Auburn, who was Auburn Tourism, it came to Mr. Savarese uh, when the Super Seven was in in Birmingham to see about having just hoping part of the basketball. Uh, but Mr. Savarese didn't like, you know, what was going on in Birmingham. There was no improvements to Legion Fields mm -hmm. and, you know, there were still some issues. And he offered Ron and Don Staley, who was over the sports and tourism in, in Tuscaloosa, to come down and they talked about it. And that's how we ended up being on Auburn and Alabama's campuses for those games. 
And two years ago, uh, the city of Birmingham came and wanted to get in the rotation with the new building of Protective Stadium. So last fall in 21, we had the first year of the three three school rotation uh, in Birmingham. This year it's in Auburn, and you know we'll go to uh, uh, Brian Denny next year, and we'll rotate. So it's an awesome possibility uh, that we have and growing, and we have other universities that want to get involved in the rotation. So. Uh, it, we're excited. I mean, it gives everybody a chance to, as we see our fans, to get on campuses they would never normally be on and to give those communities a chance to shine those, uh, the, the old community. So we're excited about it. It's an opportunity to, to showcase our young people on campuses that they would normally never be around. Well, and, and plus for the players, I mean, playing at Jordan-Hare, playing at Bryant-Denny, and now protective stadium, that's that's a different feeling than the, the, your normal Friday night. It is, you know, the great thing about it, you know, those kids get to, they, those stadiums open up everything to us. So it's like they're their home stadium, the home teams in the home locker room, the visiting teams in the visiting locker room, everybody's got that locker room. They come out the tunnels the same way they do in, in, in Tuscaloosa and Protective and Auburn. And they get excited and all the things, the lights, the acts, and the video boards are all showcasing them and their community. So it's it's exciting and you know it's it's a joy to see their faces when they come out that tone. Mm -hmm. Well, just I'm curious, how does the state determine who's the home team and who's the visiting team at the championships? Well, it's all based on brackets. Okay. Uh, it's all drawn out through the brackets and, and throughout the playoffs is, is how it's determined. Uh, it's not predetermined, uh, but the brackets are set every year and they rotate, the quadrants rotate, there's a whole rotation, so it's not the same on, on, on the brackets. You know, it could be a different one, but that's how it's determined. You know, it's, it's the Super 7 now because we have seven classifications. Yeah. I remember when I was growing up, it was six. Yeah. Then, I mean, before that, it was five. So what goes into determining, you know, how these classifications are set? I know it's school size, but wh why does it keep growing? Well, uh, it's just the, 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 the demographics and everything between the classifications. And uh, our board, we, uh, the board meets uh, every two years because we review classification. And it's based on the school size, like you said earlier, and where we're going. And uh, it, it's a chance to, to spread everything out a little bit more. And we're you know, trying to keep it as balanced as possible. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to football, I know at the college level, the game has really been changed by this um, transfer portal, the name, image, and likeness, the NIL thing. I mean, it's just really rocked college football. I'm curious, has that – um, trickled down to high school at all to impact the game at the high school level? We really haven't felt it yet, and I think partly because they're still trying to figure out the maneuverability, you know, with the NIL, you know, the, the NCAA and the schools haven't right quite got a handle on it. The transfer portal, they've done some different things. It used to be a wide open deal, now they've kind of closed the period when you can transfer, we can do things. And I think uh, the reality of the schools are getting a little bit more selective on what they're doing with the transfer portal because, you know, um, there's, the, you know, just my personal opinion, which, you know, that there's a reason why these why these young people are leaving. You kind of want to know what's going on, you know, so that it's a little bit more uh, intriguing now to watch that happen. Uh, and, you know, it's, 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 I don't know how it's going to impact later, but uh, right now we haven't felt any impact and we're keeping an eye on it. Mm. It really is uh, amazing to, to, to watch all that play out because you know, players are really in charge uh, now, right? They're, they're kind of uh, in charge of their own destiny, more so maybe than they have been in the past. Well, speaking of that, I mean, you've had a football life, a football career. Can you share with our audience your background coming up in, in football and coaching? Well, uh, you know, like you, I, I played small town, uh, Greenville, Alabama, uh, there and um, was lucky enough to, to be on some good teams and uh, had a chance to go play at Auburn and, you know, for Coach Dye and uh, was very lucky enough to be a part of uh, two SEC championships there and uh, play with some great players. and. Uh, had a chance to sign a free agent contract with the Dallas Cowboys and, and Tom Landry was there, you know, uh, played for Wayne Woodham in high school, uh, you know, so I played for some great coaches and had some great, great teammates that were around me and we had, we had a lot of fun and 
Um, you know, from there, um, ended up uh, at the University of North Alabama with my with my former position coach at Auburn, Bobby Wallace, and um, we were there and uh, were lucky enough to be a part of uh, four conference championships and three national championships with some with some great players and great coaches. Uh, you know, it was just an awesome opportunity and. Uh, and uh, was able to be a part of uh, a lot of great things in, in, throughout football. Well, I know football isn't the only sport going on right now. There's volleyball, there's cross country, swimming and diving. What's, what's happening in the rest of these fall sports? Well, you know, we, a couple of weeks ago we finished our volleyball championships, and which was great. We held that in Birmingham at the Birmingham Crossplex and had, uh, you know, 54 great games and, and, and uh, uh, seven great uh, volleyball championship games. and. This past weekend, we had our cross-country championship at the Jesse Owens facility up in Moulton, Alabama. It's a great facility, uh, a nationally run facility, um, and it was a great, great turnout and had some records broken. Uh, you know, of course, we started our football playoffs. We have our sectional swim meet starting next weekend, getting ready for state swim meet that's going to finale that's going to end up in Auburn the same weekend as Super 7. So uh, it's going to be a lot of uh, action going on in Auburn uh, uh, the last uh, couple of days of November, first uh, two days in, in, in uh, December in, in, in Auburn. So uh, we're rounding out our fall championships. And of course, we're having basketball starting now, wrestling starting now, and indoor track. So it's into one season and starting in winter sports season. So it's, uh, it's exciting times. It's exciting times and probably busy for the Alabama Athletic uh, or High School Athletic Association. Well, again, thanks for coming on Capital Journal. Really appreciate your time. Oh, thank you for having me. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. That's our show for tonight. Thank you for watching. And a special thank you to Alabama's military veterans on this Veterans Day. We are ever grateful for your service to this great country. For our Capitol Journal team, I'm Todd Stacy. We'll see you next time.